Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a wonderful box on brilliant classics of the complete Corelli. I mean, what an easy thing to do. Corelli is an amazing composer in many respects. He really is. He lived from 1653 to 1713. Most of his music was published at the end of his life or towards the end of his life in the 1690s and early 17s. There are only six opus numbers. That's it. That's all he allowed to be published. There are some miscellaneous pieces that have come to light since that are, you know, sort of singletons or earlier versions of other works. And, and they're in here. They're in here, too. So you get the whole batch. But but still, it's really amazing for a couple of reasons. Number one is that he was so careful in particular in polishing everything to the finest, finest point of perfection. And second of all, that he was one of the very, very first composers who made his reputation entirely as a composer of instrumental music, not vocal music. And it's amazing, especially when you consider that he was Italian, the home of voices and opera and vocal things. But Corelli was an instrumental composer, and he, his entire reputation rests on that. And he was universally admired as such, as a specialist in the art of Baroque instrumental writing. And he was a definitive figure in the art of Baroque instrumental writing and establishing the forms of Baroque inst instrumental music. And those forms were quite simply the trio sonata, the solo sonata, and the, the concerto, the concerto grosso, actually. Um, specifically, which opposes a large ensemble to a smaller ensemble. In Corelli's case, you have the large body of strings and a small group of solo strings. And that is really an amazing legacy. It's an easy legacy to get in a box and wonderful to sample at, at, at your leisure. You know, the opi, or op opera, actually, the, the plural of opus is opera. But we can call it opi or opia or opiates or whatever you want to call it. Who cares? Um, there are. Let's go through these. And that's it. We're going to go through them. And the performances are quite fine. It, they, they feature Musica Amphion under Peter Jan Belder. Peter Jan Belder is that wonderful harpsichordist. We've been, we've been sampling his complete Scarlatti. He's done everything for harpsichord in the Baroque period. Just about an unbelievably prolific and very, very fine keyboard soloist. And we have some, some you know, wonderful soloists here whose names I will, I'm not even going to try to pronounce, but they're well known. Well, there's Albert Bruggen. He's one of the Bruggens. Remember Franz Bruggen? Well, this is those Bruggens. And Jap Terlinden. You may have heard of him. And uh, let's see, who else have we got? Well, there's William Roth and Frank Wackelkamp and, 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 and Remy Baudet and Sayuri Yam, Yamagata. And I mean, you know, these aren't names that are going to be household words. They're your early music specialist performers and very, very good ones. I mean, really very good ones. Um, and they're, they're fully up to the demands of the music and they're beautiful performances. So what do you get? What's in here? So the first CD, the first CD is Trio Sonatas Opus One. Um, and that's a little, little opi um, of our opera, pardon me. How many of them are there? 12 little sonatas. Yes, most of these come in groups of 12. Um, and so one opus has 12 separate works. Now, a trio sonata is a sonata in three parts. Those parts being two melody voices and the bass. And there's supposed to be a certain level of equality. The interesting thing about a trio sonata is that there is no actual limit to the number of instruments that can play a trio sonata. What matters in Baroque music is not the number of players, but the number of parts. And so trio sonatas will be sonatas written in three parts. As I said, two, two soprano or melody lines and the bass line. And that bass line will be taken by usually a harpsichord or some other keyboard instrument. It could be an organ, it can be, it can be a clavichord, it can even be a piano if you want to do it you know, in a modern way, along with a cello or, or something else on the bass line. Sometimes they toss in a lute or a guitar or a chitaroni or a, or a theorbo or God knows what else. It doesn't make any difference because what matters is that you've got three parts. And so Corelli wrote piles of trio sonatas, well piles, he didn't write piles of anything, there are only six opus numbers, but since each one has 12 in it, 
12 works, more or less, um, you get more bang for your buck, right? So you've got Trio Sonatas Opus 1, then you've got Trio Sonatas Opus 2, along with a few other, other without opus. Um, earlier versions or alternate versions of the same works. Then we've got Trio Sonatas Opus 3 and Trio Sonatas Opus 4. So the first four opera out of six are all Trio Sonatas. Um, for violins, usually two violins are the solo instruments. Now, Opus 5 is a by a pile of solo violin sonatas. That is, sonatas for one instrument plus the continuo. They're really sonatas in two parts because you've got the bass line. In Baroque music, you've always got the bass line. That's your fundamental part. And above that, you have the melodic part. And the violin, the solo violin, is the melodic part in this case. Now, there are actually 11 violin sonatas um, and in, in four movements for the most part. But then the number 12, which isn't numbered as such, is a series of variations on a famous, famous, famous Baroque tune called La Folia, which everybody said. It was one of those common, really harmonic patterns, more of a bass line than a melody. And it was used over and over again by like a bazillion Baroque composers. It is also the subject of Rachmaninoff's Corelli variations. You know, it's a tune that really wasn't by Corelli. It was one that he used. But that, that's, that's La Folia de España is actually the, the Follies of Spain is actually uh, the full title of the tune in question. And, you know, Western music is full of these wonderful sort of generic tunes that people used. I mean, I may do a talk about that would be kind of interesting. You know, these different tunes, there was L'Homme Armé, which was the subject of like every mass written in the Renaissance period. And there's the Dies Irae, Gregorian chant that everybody used, you know, do, 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 do. They're just, they're just tunes that, that composers love to work with. There are others, you know, God Save the King is one of them. And, and, and there's, oh, it's so much fun. And the Paganini tune, you know, from the 24th Caprice or whatever that thing is. Do, 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 which every composer wrote variations on. There are a few, and they're, they're quite wonderful. Anyway, I think maybe we will do a talk on that. That sounds like a fun topic, doesn't it? Finally, we have the Concerti Grossi Opus 6, which includes the famous Christmas Concerto and uh, some other, some other well-known gems. You know, both chamber music, chamber works and concerti also came, aside from the fact that we're talking about trio sonatas, and regular sonatas and solo sonatas and concerti. Uh, there were also, there was also another wider distinction in Baroque music, the church piece and chamber piece. Church pieces, generally speaking, began with a slow movement and had relatively fewer dance movements because that would not be appropriate to a church. They were played in church as, as interlude music during the divine service. And so, and so they had to be of a certain level of seriousness where the church authorities who objected to music of any kind, you know, as often as not, um, would have objected even more. Chamber works, on the other hand, camera, I mean, chamber not meaning small, it means to be played in a secular environment, could have more, usually more movements, a livelier overall tempo and mood, fewer things in minor keys, more dance pieces interspersed. They could begin with a quick movement. There, there's no real hard and fast definition between the two. I mean, Corelli distinguishes between them in, in his various opera. But generally speaking, they're, they're, they're pretty heterogeneous and you don't have to worry about it. But you should just know that they exist because you'll see people say, you know, Sonata da Chiesa church sonatas or sonata da camera and that's what it means that's what the distinction is and you get both and for that reason Corelli's overall oeuvre really set up baroque instrumental music for the next wow 50 or 60 years really he was one of the most respected composers who ever lived during his lifetime and afterwards he appears to have been a really, really nice guy, somebody who no one had anything bad to say about, and, and he was a dedicated craftsman, um, a master of his art. And it's all in this, this lovely little box that has how many CDs? 10 CDs. 10 CDs. And it's worth having. It's really a linchpin of any, any collection of serious Baroque music. 
um, or any serious collection of Baroque music, and I think you'll enjoy it enormously. It's on brilliant classics, and it's quite fine. So keep on listening. Friends, thank you so much for joining me. Take care.